Okay. Well, thanks to everyone for joining today. Uh, I'm Mary Price. I'm the events and marketing manager at the Shingo Institute at Utah State University. I'm really excited to have Cheryl Jekyll with us today. Cheryl is a Shingo faculty fellow and she is CEO of the Lean Leadership Center. Recently, we just launched the Shingo HR learning community that Cheryl and Helen Zach oversee. Helen is the director of research at the Shingo Institute. This is a community of HR professionals from a variety of organizations that embrace Shingo principles. If you're interested in learning more, please let me know and I'll connect you to them. We also published an article in our monthly newsletter that just went out yesterday. It talks more about the topic we're discussing today. That article can be found on our website. Just go to shingo.org, click the media tab and select the blog. You'll find the article there. It's titled, The Big Mistake with HR. As a reminder, all of our webinars can be found on our Shingo YouTube channel. You can access that from our website under the media tab, just click videos. And with that, Cheryl, I'll turn the time over to you. Thank you, Mary. I'm excited to be here today. So um, as Mary said, I'm Cheryl Jekyll, and um, I'm excited to share with you today some of my um, recent experiences. And um, this is the area I've devoted my entire career to, so I'm excited to share some of it with you. So I'm going to start with this story. Um, recently, it was several months back, I got... Um, uh, actually, John Shingo, some of you probably, or John Shook, uh, sent me a um, post that he thought was interesting. It's from the Harvard Business Review from October of 22. And it was an article about how HR lost employees' trust and how to get it back. And I thought it was a Sunday morning, so I sat down and read it. And it was just a really interesting discussion about the pros and cons of how HR has um, in the interest of protecting the company, lost people's trust, and then it gave very specific ways of how that could be remedied. And so I went ahead, no big deal so far, sent it out to my following and um, on LinkedIn and was just curious to get some other people's thoughts. So nothing really prepared me for what was about to come. Um, there were hundreds hundreds of comments. The comments themselves weren't surprising. It was the length of the letters and even when I was recently rechecking what the comments looked like, there were some people who might have made a comment and it would have its own 35 responses to that one comment. So these were long letters. And so apparently the more I read through it, there was this topic of how HR is positioned in the company um, certainly struck a nerve. And certainly, as I mentioned when I started, it's what I've devoted most of my career to. So it was certainly of interest to me. And as I read through it, I just wanna share a bit about what I got out of that. So there were a number of comments that either shared times people had really been hurt, like they had trusted HR to be advocating for them. And when that didn't happen, they were literally what caused them, I think, to write such a long letter was the depth of their hurt or pain from, from feeling um, misled in some way that they thought that that, that would be, um, that they would be better represented. There were some um, that also were very clear, they just don't see it to be any other way. In fact, one of the comments that got 35 responses was like, it couldn't be any other way, that because of litigation and all the risks that HR must and only must uh, represent the company to protect their interest against risks. What I'm gonna speak to today is um, from my point of view, and there were certainly some of the posts that, that spoke to it, I would say that I think it would be a mistake to put HR in a mode of being somehow pro-company and not um, certainly that what's best for people and employees is certainly in the best interest of the organization. I've been in HR for many years and a lot of times when we would behave in a way that was maybe more afraid of what would happen, we would cause the very problems we were trying to prevent and the more we took the stance that probably doing what's good for people, it would turn into an environment that makes it unlikely that the things you're worried about would even happen. So I'm going to talk today about my premise that I believe the more we um, devote uh, companies and certainly the role of HR to truly optimizing the workplace for people, I think the more it actually does protect the interests of, of the organization. So what is all this though? This whole story about this posting that was, um, by the way, created a big shift for me. Um, what does that have to do with the Shingo model and human resources? 
So as I've become a faculty member in the last couple of years and now spend much more of my time around Shingo organizations and um, uh, learning about it and, and how the two connect, it certainly ties in. We're gonna go through very specific ways that HR has a role with all the aspects of system thinking in the Shingo model and certainly how we um, develop the guiding principles and skills and abilities that go with it. So why do we see though that there's been such an issue um, with human resources? So again, this posting certainly brought to light um, a lot of people are very dissatisfied with the way HR is functioning and um, are struggling to see a different way of doing it. And so I always like to start with what the root causes are. But before I would speak to what I think are the issues with HR, let's start with what I believe to be one of the biggest issues with improvement itself. It became clear to me early in my career that there was a sense of continuous improvement being somehow like in the idea of reducing waste. It was as if you could make, let's say, products um, for less money, like you could lean them out and streamline them. And I'm not saying that that's not a good idea and certainly not certainly a focus of, of, of improvement. But the greater value from where I've usually been witnessing continuous improvement lies much more with the people. The more, you know, we've always said the eighth waste is when you unleash the capability of people. I don't really think we fully consider what the power and the, even the financial benefit of that might be. So I'm going to speak today about maybe some different ways to think about that. So it's not a matter that you wouldn't want to lean things down or reduce waste, but to really consider more broadly and in a bigger way, what would be the value of truly unleashing the talent in um, by re. Uh, shifting how the workplace is operating and how people's roles are, are functioning. The other second reason why I think that there's been um, not always clarity on what the role of HR could be with continuous improvement beyond not quite considering what the real value of it could be is most organizations, while they're speaking to engagement and want engagement and might even measure engagement, they're still mostly struggling with really what does that take? Um, it tends to be much more of like efforts that aren't quite happening. Uh, most organizations that I've been aware of that are measuring engagement find very small levels of improvement. If not, sometimes it goes backwards and they're not sure why. Again, from a working conversation point of view, I've also seen a lot of times there isn't really a clear understanding of what are the key drivers of engagement. We're going to talk a bit about that in a minute. And last but not least, and I always say this with love in my heart is I've certainly seen HR um, for years and in many, many organizations struggling to escape work that doesn't add value. And I want to be clear, I had many years of being in HR, even well as I got into my continuous improvement capabilities and focus. I mean, I wrote my book on um, lean HR well before I was done working in private industry. And I remember thinking to myself is I would be completely stuck in non-value added work that it really is harder than it looks to get out of it. Um, at the time I was working on a system that was antiquated. We hadn't um, at that time been able to purchase the newer HR system um, that would have gotten us into what we would have called this, you know, how to go paperless, make sure that also if you're entering data, you only enter it once. And so things like that and hiring, you know, hundreds of people at a shop um, whenever you're hiring large groups of employees, uh, you can have a lot of just time and energy that feels hard to get into more strategic work when you're mired in things that a lot of HR processes need to be updated. And even if you knew better, it doesn't mean that they're easy to change. And so I imagine for any HR people listening today or at any other time, they're saying, yeah, I get it needs to be better. It's just um, kind of a struggle to get um, the things in place that would make that um, possible to be adding more, more value on a day-to-day -day basis. So those are some of the root causes, but next, what's obviously much more interesting, what's the opportunity? So we have people value streams is gonna be, I wanna to introduce today for some of you that might not have heard it, a different way to think about people in general in the workplace. And it's a different way to see what some of the opportunities might be. So bottom lining it, when we think of, um, the whole idea of people in the workplace as people value streams, 
we want to be considering if we optimize how individuals are functioning. So like they're what we call personal flow in terms of how well we create a workplace that does well for just what people need on a day-to-day -day basis with how they're naturally wired, we can then dramatically improve the performance. So it's a different way to look at how well are we optimizing how people are functioning. And um, I first heard about this from Peter Hines, um, who is another Shingo faculty fellow. And, and Peter and I have always had this shared passion for the role of HR. And I have to tell you, when Peter first introduced me to this, I was thinking people value streams was going to be like, how do we hire people? And what are those, you know, basically the employment processes? Given with the nature of mindset, something like what you might see across the top, selection, performance management, reward systems, as those flow. What I then learned much more about was how do we take what we know about humans, which is a lot, we know a lot about what makes people tick and what they need. How do we take that whole science, especially what's known about that and apply it to the workplace? So how do we get more clear? What do people naturally need and how well are we tending to that? And if we focus HR in this way, if their role is to improve how people are functioning, then we see it's really one of the most important areas in the organization to make sure we're optimizing that. And then we also go back to that, mis that idea that HR is there for the business and not the employee. We realize that really goes against this idea. And I really believe this is what the power of HR can be, if not revolutionize what its role is. The more um, a function that's devoted to people could help people function better, the more valuable it would be, and it would be clearly all value-added work. I then believe some of the investment and time and attention to fixing the non-value-added parts of HR would naturally dissipate because there'd be more clarity. Many organizations, by the work that's done, how people are functioning is critical to what the results are. So it becomes more obvious why we'd want to optimize this. I'm going to speak some more during this about how to think about what we would do differently. So this is my view of people value streams, the same thing, but just a simpler way to see it. It starts with this idea that what optimizes for people is their sense of meaning in their work and self-reliance. Those are two critical elements we want to consider with how well people are functioning is the more meaning and um, they're getting out of it an ability they can um, be um, masters of their own destiny, so to speak. From there, we have these individual value streams that I just talked about, those different elements of what people need. That then creates how teams are functioning, leadership functions, and then in the end, uh, that creates the value for the, for the stakeholders, whether it be customers, shareholders, or the community at large. So based upon this and the discussion today about HR, how do we set HR up for more success. So I'm going to go over what I think some of those ways are. First of all, the people value stream mode of looking at things speaks to this more as individuals rather than teams. And again, having been in HR for most of my career, a lot of times it was like, well, we had a way to hire, or we had a way to onboard, or we had certain kinds of training efforts. Everything generally was one approach for all. And it tended to be always thinking of employees like if you have a 200 people in a facility or a thousand people in a facility, it's as if they're all one person, you know, one group with the same needs. The more we want to think about optimizing individual flow, the more we want to be considering people as individuals instead of like grouping them all together. And there's different ways of doing that, which I won't necessarily go into today, but the first way of looking at it differently. And when we think about the Shingo model, we think about respect for individuals or for every individual. It really ties into that idea that we want to inherently be thinking about, are we showing respect for individuals and assuming that they are different and what they need is different, especially at different times or places. So this creates more of um, what I call a need for um, programming that might be varied based upon different kinds of needs people might have. Now, the next thing I'm gonna go over is my work over the years came down to understanding um, basically the elements of how HR can add value in a systemic way is three ways. 
The first is create the design and I'll go over what that means. The second would be how we build leadership skills. And the third is how we grow people. But as we start with create the design, what do I mean by that? That's really the talent system. So we know from a system view that we wanna make sure that whatever's in, however people do tie in um, to the systems, whether it be how we hire them, again, all those other elements, we wanna start with a blueprint. What I've mostly seen missing is um, things like job descriptions are generally not considered all that value added and many are outdated and don't necessarily tie to anything else. So one is getting clear, what's our architecture? What's the underlying organization for how roles are defined and how people understand that work and how it's been designed? This is the design of work, not necessarily documenting what's true today. We also then those create opportunities to integrate all the continuous improvement elements of um, methodologies, the behaviors you're looking for, the skills you're building in, so again, as we design roles, we want to integrate all those things. We want to do it not in a way we create binders or files of job descriptions, but we want to do it in a way that it's um, what I call creates a working knowledge, um, a value added process for people to be understanding how they're integrating these things into their daily work life. We also want to get a lot of alignment. I always said, just said to someone yesterday, when HR is not necessarily positioned well to be overseeing these systems as they tie to continuous improvement, it's not harmless. What you can see is you'll now have disconnects. Um, if it's not streamlined to be able to um, keep up with these changes and transformations, then a lot of times it's out of step and it's helping, it's actually part of the problem. Along with these same talent systems, as I've alluded to, there's some of these that are very specific and all need to be both um, tended to separately and together. So again, you wanna make sure we're getting that alignment, which the blueprint handles. So again, thinking about hiring, how we select people that will do well in the right workplace that you're creating and onboarding them in a way that's effective. Again, creating engagement, but also sending all the right messages and behaviors that you're gonna be looking for. So starting right from the very beginning. Um, not news to anybody here, training and development is a core piece of how continuous improvement and HR builds that in. We have all the elements of accountability. I just had someone write me a note this morning. How does performance management change in a continuous improvement workplace? And how can we talk more about that? And then certainly last but not least, there's a lot of things over the years, traditional workplaces reward, and I don't mean just financially, it could be anywhere, what we recognize, um, one group calls it the hero complex. We recognize people for being heroic rather than we recognize process and we recognize teamwork and we wanna see people um, working for the greater good together rather than recognizing people who stand out as a one-off. All of these things, I don't think there's one way to look at them, but I think they're things that we all need to be exploring and considering and challenging as to how well they're supporting our improvement efforts. The next piece is the leadership skills. So if we have the design, we now know in general, continuous improvement requires leaders who um, are much more oriented towards, for lack of a better word, a coaching approach. This requires not only getting clear what coaching means, but developing those skills takes practice and more practice. Um, again, I could speak for a whole other half hour on what it takes to develop these uh, modes of leaders. What I would say over 25 years of watching it, most organizations that I had seen in transfer, you know, looking to do continuous improvement transformation have been struggling with actually how to get groups, especially large groups of leaders to make this shift. So I think it's one of the big challenges, again, human resources having a big role to play with what that needs to look like. Um, I'm just gonna briefly mention one of the things I had developed from um, actually redesigning first line supervisor training. So in the field of continuous or of human resources, it's commonly one of the responsibilities is to make sure there's some kind of training for first line supervisors. At some point, I was watching how much damage that was doing to continuous improvement efforts. And so we made a change in um, creating a model that was much more oriented towards uh, a continuous improvement work base, workplace. And it uses a coaching style for every element. So it introduces being the coach every day, all day, 
And then some of your improvement skills sit on top of that. And also very much working from the heart, taking out some of the negative elements um, that, um, so for instance, I'm not a believer in any kind of what I would call disciplinary process. Now that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be any circumstance that you might, but in general, I think the more we make sure leaders set people up for success, make sure people are effectively trained, that people are getting the right coaching feedback and recognition of the right behaviors, the less likely there really are a significant amount of problems with people from an employment point of view. It's really helping to set leaders up to be able to effectively meet those responsibilities. And most of them, we're just not giving them enough help or support to do that. The last part is being able to grow your people. So now if you have leaders who are empowering, we wanna make sure now and only now are we um, making sure we're growing the capabilities of people. What I mean by that is what I've seen happen is if we go immediately to working with people doing the work and build their skills, it then hits like a roadblock because the leaders working with them aren't prepared to support that. So now we create that level of engagement and when it's not met with leaders who know what to do with it, we can actually damage levels of engagement. So that's what I mean by that. So from there, HR certainly has a role in structuring how that does, uh, making sure if there's training being done, is it effective training? Um, are we monitoring the results of it? All those kinds of things. So it doesn't mean HR unilaterally owns all these things, but they could be a big, important partner in making sure all that's done and done effectively. Um, I'm going to wait to I see some questions coming in. I'm going to make sure I end in enough time to pick those up. So what do you have to gain? Um, I think I mentioned earlier, I think we underestimate what improvement is really worth. There's a huge overlap between what HR knows of what drives engagement, because again, HR often owns engagement surveys and, and um, improving those things and continuous improvement. Here's just a quick list of what those are. Key engagement drivers are things like connecting to a bigger vision, have a good work relationship with your supervisors, make sure um, you can take care of things that are bothering you in your work, being able to learn and work with others. If you look at improvement, again, it's not news to any of you, much of what goes on in continuous improvement is absolutely an overlay with engagement. And I haven't seen generally in, or in organizations when they're doing all their continuous improvement work that they're as clear as they could be that you're actually one of the big um, additional benefits of that continuous improvement is the driving of engagement. Another theory that leans uh, right into this is self-determination theory, which has been one of my favorite things I've started working with in the last couple of years. There's three primary things we know that people need. This is just a nice, easy list to remember. They need to be able to um, do good work. They need to be able to do their work and do it well. Two, there's a strong need in most individuals to feel like they can control their uh, life, which would include being able to um, be involved in how their work is being done. That's why continuous improvement is such a huge natural motivator and relatedness. My favorite part of doing continuous improvement over the years has been how we work in teams and how people work together. And again, all of these things are naturally motivational, which naturally makes the workplace a better place. So again, look at the overlap between what we see in improvement, continuous improvement and motivators. So it absolutely creates autonomy, mastery and community. So the other thing I want, it's just, I'm gonna encourage you to be thinking about is what haven't you seen when you look at continuous improvement and all the results you've ever seen from it? I still believe there's so much more it's capable of, but I think to do that, I think it's coming out of the mode, what am I trying to do? Like we're busy putting things in, it's kind of like one step at a time. That's appropriate and valuable, but I'm saying, I think I'm gonna encourage us, think in a way, what would it be if you if it was way beyond what you've ever seen? Wonder what could, what could it be? What's its opportunity? Instead of looking at it, it can just make things a little better at a time. So what would be your wildest dream? These are just some things to think about as you go forward. Wonder if everyone could identify and solve problems. Wonder if leaders were clear and confident in how they develop people and it was all leaders. Wonder if people didn't look to their leaders to solve everything. 
wonder if metrics moved in the right direction and the improvements were sustained because people were completely bought in and a part of things. Wonder if your workplace culture wasn't just engaged, it was what I call hyper-engaged and that was driving your profitability and value. So moving forward, before we end, I'm gonna comment on a few things you could be doing. One, consider how your organization is considering the value of people and how that relates to your continuous improvement. So specific things, you might do some reflection, discuss, and have some specific action steps. Second, one thing I've seen often missing is a long-term people plan. So if you look at continuous improvement and all those elements in the shingle model and principles, is there a long-term plan that each year to make cycles of improvement in the talent systems, the leadership capabilities and people's capabilities year over year? Last but not least, uh, make sure we're expanding what kinds of things we measure with people. That was one of the big parts of a people value stream. Measuring things like ideas per person, measuring behaviors, just like we have key behavior indicators, skills, levels of engagement. Wellness is a big topic. Are we measuring people's physical and mental wellness? Certainly things like retention, absenteeism, and safety. These are just to name a few. So there's a few resources. Again, this is not to plug my book. This book's been around a while, but I just want people to know if you were looking at how to redo talent systems, I wrote this 15 years ago. I'm still seeing a need for there to be clarity for HR, how the um, HR processes and practices need to be redesigned to support continuous improvement. Another resource that I've spent the last five years developing, again, I'm, this is just a book, but I'm going to be giving this book away. I'm not even charging for it. It's just a book. It's shared what I've learned in the last several years about what I've seen in organizations finally successfully developing leaders that are more of a coach. And the last thing I want to close with is how that entire posting and the response to it has changed my own sense of mission. It was the first time it really became clear to me that we really need to shift an understanding that what's good for people is good for the business. And this sense of as if they're competing interest is something really we need to work against. And to do that, I think we really need to continue to support HR being for a high value um, organization and remove the non-value added work that they're often um, contending with. So what can you do? Upgrade your expectations of engagement, improvement, and HR. Commit to expanding the role of HR with improvement strategies. And as I mentioned, the next steps, um, make some immediate, some immediate plans, some long-term plans, and measure more items related to people. So with that, I'd love to take a few questions. All right. Uh, one is, where and when do you think HR impacts the basic respect for people in an organization? Um, every day, and certainly from the very beginning, actually before you even hire people, when you actually meet people from the outside world is when organizations start to communicate how they consider people. I went on interviews that they had made every effort to make sure I felt included and supported all day. And then I've been in interviews that or when I met someone, you could tell they just aren't thinking about who you are as a person. So I think it's committing to doing that every day, all day from the day you ever meet somebody and even your broader community that you haven't met yet. Um, are you suggesting stale job descriptions, roles and responsibilities need to be updated? Absolutely. But the issue can be, um, redesigning them in a streamlined format, meaning continuous improvement generally will mean that those will need to be updated roughly every 18 months. So we need to do it not just one time. As continuous improvement principles and skills and abilities come in, you'll need to keep keeping getting it updated and make sure it's simple enough that it's not just loads and lines of um, work that you can't really see. Um, another question was, is there a difference between helping to engage versus motivate? Engagement is generally considered more intrinsic, um, more internal. That's where that connection to work feeling more meaningful is more powerful than things that might be motivating, meaning you might um, be more um, um, energetic about your work and interested and motivated. Engagement is just the more powerful of the two. 
And then uh, there was a question here about measuring behaviors, and I gave some examples of that. And um, the question is also whether it would apply to executives. Absolutely. Um, they're part of the team. I think it's just also realizing we need to account for 100% of the team, not just a few. I don't know if there's any other questions. Let me see in the comments if there's any questions in here. Um, how can you address how defeating it is for middle managers? Um, this is an area of great interest of mine. Um, the work I've done, which I don't think certainly doesn't require my work, but here's what I have learned, is we're not doing enough to support them. I'm a believer we need to create leadership communities. There's not enough HR people or even um, managers of the middle managers to give them really the care and support they need. So I think it's creating um, communities within your workplace where managers are talking about their struggles with leadership, uh, what they want to be doing, and letting them help each other down that road. What I've seen um, create success is they're all moving their leadership together, and they provide that support to each other. Um, measurable success at any level. Well, certainly one place you're going to see clear measurable success is in engagement. I have certainly seen as some organizations um, create real enhancements to the workplace for people, meaning that they feel happier and more engaged in their work, you're going to see all those other things improve. You're going to see retention improve. Um, I've seen it both get worse. By the way, the problem is when these things are not on track, these measurements can get worse. And going the other way, the better and better it gets, the more they generally get better with some amount of momentum to them. Um, let me see if there's more questions in here. Mary, you just need to tell me if I need to stop. Um, all right, are you suggesting? Yep, I got all those. I think I got all those questions. I don't know if there's any more out here. Um, we got one more in the Q&A. <laughs> all right, I'll go for it. Um, oh, the last thing I wanted to mention today. So um, this wasn't necessarily a question. It was a comment saying, I'm very glad to attend uh, Lena and HR's Gulf for Companies. And uh, I'm interested in seeing over time how we can, as a community, work on this uh, effort together. So with that, the last thing I wanted to mention today is this Shingo HR community. And um, so what we're what I have seen make a big difference for HR, it's the, I always say they listen the most to each other. So Helen and I, uh, Helen's from the, Zach from the Shingo Institute are working together to simply facilitate um, a community so that we'll be bringing HR people together. The community will decide what topics it wants to go over and, and how, but we'll be creating lots of um, networking um, opportunities so they can get to know each other and move the best practices in the area of HR together as a community. So I'm excited about that. We just kicked it off this last month. There's room for a few more organizations to join. And if it goes past that, we might just break into more than one group. But I'm interested in seeing how much we can have HR people, and especially in the Shingo environment, uh, support each other. Um, we have one last question. What about payment gaps, especially between senior leadership and general staff? Um, certainly a lot of best practices in here make that gap not as pronounced, and there certainly are ways to um, join uh, or to improve how pay aligns. I generally would promote, though, that I think pay is one of the last steps I would take to create the right culture. Um, generally has only a temporary um, way it's helpful, and then it, it quickly can sometimes become a problem. So I would be careful with how you handle pay treatment. To join the community, you have two emails out here, reach out to us. Generally, I start with a quick phone call to just go over the community, make sure everybody's clear what it is. And then if you want to join, we have a simple registration process and then you can join. Um, leading measures for the manufacturing industry um, were some of the ones I mentioned. I think behavior indicators, which Shingo does a lot to teach us about, can be hugely helpful in terms of are we getting the right behaviors, like the right leadership behaviors that will drive that right continuous improvement environment. Um, I believe if, if there's a question on this transcript, it's, I have no problem sharing the slides, the transcript. Um, 
again, what my hope is, I'm not going to be working that many more years. And what I'm interested in having other people become interested in this, anything I can do to support that, I'd love to have others of you do. The next time we're discussing this, I'd love to have some of you participate. With that, I Perfect. think we're good. I think we're all good too. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I really appreciate it. Excellent information. I hope all the attendees enjoyed it as well. This will be available on our YouTube channel so you can go back and review it. And I will also send a follow-up email and share Cheryl's and Helen's information with everyone so you can contact them directly as well. So thank you so much and we hope to see you again. Good to see everybody.